and Becker. Garth is an associate in the commercial law department. Garth has exper Garth's experience includes drafting various commercial agreements, including franchise agreements, shareholder agreements, share sale agreements, pledge agreements, commercial leases, and documentation for mergers, mergers and acquisitions. Garth has also presented lectures on intellectual property law and information, communications and technology law. He is a student member of the South African Institute of Intellectual, intellectual Property Law. Good morning, Garth, and welcome. Morning, Romani, and morning, viewers. How are you? Good, good. And how are you today? How's the lockdown treating you? Uh, it's good. I just can't wait to leave the house, but then we have to do it. We have to, do it. Yeah. We have to keep safe. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I tell you, it feels like you're a bit caged in, doesn't it? Yeah, cabin fever. It's been a bit too yeah. long now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Well, we've had a bit of technical issues, so let's bear with us today and let's see how we get on. Because today we're going to be discussing, because we've had a lot of people asking that they've got existing businesses and they want to know how they can go about franchising their business. And I thought this would be a perfect opportunity for Garth to share some insights and some, some knowledge relating to franchising a business. So Garth, what would you, what should a person consider before they decide to, to franchise their business? So they've got an existing business and they're ready to expand. What are the things that they need to think about and consider before they even start that process? Well, the very first thing that you have to consider is if you have a good reputation in the marketplace. Um, and this can be achieved in many ways. So advertising extensively, maybe having one, maybe having more than one store. But if you have a good reputation, it's a good first step. And you have good systems to run into place. Because I'll just do an example quickly. Remember in 2013 when Burger King arrived, those long lines? To enter the store, that was because I had existing reputation ways. If I were to open Romani's burgers, for example, we wouldn't have such a long line. That's not to say that your burgers won't be good, Romani. That's just to say that working have a better, has a better reputation. So the first aspect would be reputation and that you have good systems in place to branch out. And what about the mindset? I mean, because obviously, you know, running your own one, say, one store or two stores is kind of manageable. But once you start branching out, there's quite a responsibility that comes with that. Uh, what would you say? Yeah, you need, you need to have an ambitious mindset because now it's not just about your one business, it's about branching out. So you need to be able to, to have that thinking to branch out. And also, so trust is a big issue. It's a big um, issue that others will be serving your business name because if they fail, it also will fail as well. So you have to have an ambitious mind and you have to have a trust in the mind as well because you're trusting others with your intellectual property. And also you need to have a mindset for consistency as well. Because the main aim of franchising is that if I walk into any franchise store, I would want the food. In case of food, I want that food to taste the same as the original one. And this is also is a good saying. They don't use it in business often. You're in a social setting where the um, power of the people is greater than the people in power. That means if people don't take to your product, if they don't find it consistent, the franchise will ultimately fail. That is interesting. And would you say, because you were saying, would it be better, because um, some people obviously maybe only have one business. So before you start franchising, would you say it's best to start other stores first before you go and start the process? Or would you first get your documents in place and that, uh, and what you need oh, to yeah. do? Oh, each, each case is different, but I would definitely suggest first opening additional branches first because you need to help your reputation with a big boost and that is fundamental to franchising is the reputation of your store. So if you can get more stores out, you reach more people before you become an active franchiser. So be good because also your franchisees would also want to embark in a journey with you if you already have a good reputation. They want to take advantage of that. So having more than one store goes a long way in becoming an attractive franchise. 
And what would you say must be in place in regards to documentation? And I heard you mention systems before. So what are those? What do people need to consider? Or is there a checklist that they can go through, uh, for example, that they must have A, B, C in place? What are those? Yeah, very important when you franchise, there's a few documents that you need. The first one would be the closure document that is given during the negotiation phase which tells you about the turnover, which tells the franchisee about the turnover of your business, um, number of employees, um, what IP you have and how successful your business might be with the way to franchise. So that's typically two weeks before the contract is signed, so it's within the negotiation period. So that's just to give them an overview of what they can expect. And then you have your franchise agreement. Interestingly enough, franchise agreements have to be written. They have to be written in line with the Consumer Protection Act. So they must be written in plain and understandable language. And you can conclude most agreements globally. Although it's not advised, the franchise agreement must be drafted, must be drafted in line with the Consumer Protection Act. And then also the Operations Manual, which shows you the day-to-day -day running of the business. So that the franchise you will need as well. Systems that are put in place to contain the operations when the business is around in general. Because, as I mentioned earlier, consistency is a big factor as well. We need all the franchisees to run the businesses just as the franchise and maintain that consistency. And, um, okay, so the disclosure document, just to, to recap, that, that includes how much money I would earn, what the turnover is, uh, um, basically gives me an overview of the entire business, what to expect uh, as if I'm a customer or, or say someone looking to buy the franchise business, then I would ask for that disclosure document from the company uh, to give me the information about what, what I would expect running the business. Is that correct? That's correct, Romani. Okay, and 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 as a franchisor, I am obligated to supply that information, correct? Yes, you're obligated to supply that. It's basically a pitch. So you need to let your other ground, you need to let the other party know what he's getting into, he or she, if they want to proceed further. So it's mandatory. Okay, and would you say so? When so, would you supply all these documents all at once the franchise agreement and operations, or just the disclosure as the first point and then take it further from there? Yes, disclosure is the first point because that's a negotiation document, and then what will follow is the franchise agreement, which must be drafted in line with the Consumer Protection Act. So, yeah, it's very important to point attorney with commercial and intellectual property law experience, consumer law experience, because it needs to be drafted in line with that. So that would be, that's what we call the main document, it's usually the second document, after you've now probably agreed with other let's proceed. So they may have the franchise agreement, and then after that, the operations manual shows the day-to-day -day running of the business systems that are in place. And the agreement would obviously be um, the content of the franchise agreement would be about what to expect from the franchise or uh, the, the the terms and conditions pretty much. Just help me. Um. Yes. So it will contain the rights and duties of both parties, terms and conditions, so licensing price. Very important is description of the intellectual property because that is the main aspect of franchising. It's the intellectual property. That, um, that you are licensing, so it's your trademarks. So it's very important to have registered trademarks as well, otherwise you're not really licensing anything. And so the, the reputation that comes with it, so the name, the goodwill that's attached to the business, those are main parts of the franchise agreement. Okay, and um, you earlier mentioned the operations manuals, which I think is pretty, uh, what you call self-explanatory in, 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 in many senses. So that would be how the staff is dressed, how people must behave, the culture of the company, uh, the systems that you would use, for example, within that company. Yes, correct, Romani. Okay. And uh, is there other, any advice that you can think of with regards to franchising your business? Uh, you mentioned that one should speak to, to an attorney to draw up the agreements. Would you 
Do you, would you need a franchise consultant to help you put things together? Who are the parties that are involved in, in this whole process? Yeah, so franchise consultant, definitely recommended. Actually getting together attorney. It's also very important because that's the role of drafting the franchise agreements and other documents, but also if you don't, at the time of deciding to branch out the franchise, if you don't have registered trademarks, you need to consult a trademark attorney as well because that, that's mandatory as well. And trademark registrations, they take quite a bit of time. I would say an estimate a year to get the trademark registered. So wow. there's quite a bit of planning for it. So it's important to get that trademark registered. And most franchise attorneys are also trademark attorneys. So you can have a good one-stop shop for them as well. It's important to get the right person. I didn't know it took about a year. Wow, that's quite a long time. Now, a lot of people, you know, sometimes one can uh, spend unnecessary, funds unnecessary. What would you advise people so that they don't waste a lot of their cash flow in preparation, say, before coming to speak to someone like yourself to help them in that process or going to, say, a franchise consultant? So before anyone starts that journey, um, what should they do so that they don't waste unnecessary money? Uh, I would I would go with the unconventional approach here and do a survey of how how much reputation your business have because before you waste all that money, you first need to see if it's worthwhile proceeding. See if you have any type of business. I used the example earlier of Romani burgers. No offense, Romani. I'm not saying that you wouldn't make good burgers, but <laughs> if it's not well known, it won't take off. So before you go out spend all this money, just make sure that um you have a viable reputation in place before you decide to branch out and I give it time and patience. Okay, so that's pretty much the, the, the crux of, because of, you've mentioned that a first time, it really is vitally important that you have a good grounding within the marketplace, that people know about your business, that people think good things about your business. And if you have that negative feedback um, coming in, for example, after you've conducted a survey, then see how you can go and fix those elements within your business to make the improvements within your business before you go and speak to a franchise attorney or to someone that can help help you uh, put the process together. And then also start thinking about your trademarks. Uh, what what does that involve? What does that look like? Because it is a quite a long process, a yearly process. So there's quite a lot of planning involved before you start thinking about franchising your business. Um, we've had a couple of questions that's come in uh, from, oh, on a completely different topic, but yes. Hold on. I've got Carolyn Diaz that says, becoming a franchise Franchisor requires intensive planning, incorporating marketing strategies, consistent communication to franchisees, training, support services, and foster a collaborative relationship between the franchisee and franchisees and franchisor. Thank you for that input, Carolyn. Uh, and, and your thoughts on that? Do you agree? Uh, any, any input you want to add to that? Yes, I agree with that because it, it adds to the point that I with the cost of the marketing and the research that you need to carry out. So, yes, I do agree with that, Andy. And Carolyn also says that disclosure documents and franchise agreements must outline the expectations, non-compliance protocol, etc. What is a non what does non-compliance protocol mean? So those basic those means um if you do not comply with agreements, what will happen and uh, the sanctions, not the sanctions, but the remedies that the other party has, don't keep you in. Okay, okay. So that's that's more for in case you have a bit of a fallout or things don't go quite as planned between you and the franchisee. What this would be. Okay, okay. Um, and Herschel says agreed, simple, effective, and efficient. Thanks. Okay. So Carolyn's uh, been quite busy. What is an SOP? The how to. A franchiser must ensure those standard operating R, standard operating procedures and fully explained and understood. Thank you, Carolyn. 
All right, so there's some great advice, people saying thank you, fantastic advice coming in. We've also had questions coming in from a totally different, on a totally different topic, because I think on top of people's minds at the moment is the TERS. So from WhatsApp, we've had people come in. Uh, Tandi has mentioned that she um, has a new employee, and um, is she eligible to receive TERS benefit because she's only been with the company since the beginning of March, but she has contributed to the UIF at her previous job. This is the beginning of March. Yeah, yeah. She joined the company at the beginning of March, and uh, but in her previous role in the company that she worked for, she's been paying UIF, but now can her new employer um, apply for the TERS? Yes, I saw within time, when it gets towards the end of March, that's when people generally wouldn't be el eligible, but um, start of the start of March, you should, you should be eligible, yeah. Um, but also on that note, um, there is quite a backlog with the claims, as I understand, so it's all about patience, but yes, she, she can claim benefit from those. I believe so. I was watching something yesterday where they were saying that the UIF is having a bit of pressure and uh, people might not be expecting their monies too soon. Something along those lines. I did see that. Yeah. So I think people are going to have to have a lot of patience in this time uh, and, and kind of look at it. You might not get the money now, but it will come in and it will be like a bonus later <laughs> when hopefully things <laughs> All the way I can think of dealing with it, you know. It's a good um, way to think of it. <laughs> <I don't. laughs> and um, tell me something. Um, what I wanted. Oh yes, there was another question that said someone also they're having te less than ten employees, and mm -hmm. they claim for tours, but their employees don't have bank accounts. And I know that there are people that don't have bank accounts when it comes to being paid. How does that work? Yeah, you see, the problem with that is um, if you have less than 10 employees with TERS, then they pay to the individual bank accounts directly. So that could be big, a big issue. I would actually advise you to try and open one now um, because from an admin point of view, it's almost impossible to pay them out given the procedure. Okay. Okay, so, 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 all right, so the advice would be then to rather just open that bank account and then try and, and, and see how you can work around that. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Okay, well, um, if there's anything else you'd like to add uh, to the conversation, Grant, is there any way that uh, anything else you'd advise people at this point in time? Yeah, so, so big, a big question regarding to is how much money employees will get so they use a sliding scale um 38 to 60 percent of the salary to the 17,100 so if you earn more than that they will cap your percentage at the scale which ends at 17,100 and you get a percentage of that depending on how much you earn so it doesn't mean that higher in these people that earn 25,000 for example can benefit it just means that they won't get as much as they would usually get and that the, the, the cap amount ends at 17,100 from which they make the determination. So that's very important because many people could be thinking that if you earn over a certain amount that you can't benefit, but you can. It's just they cap the amount which they calculate from. Okay, wow. All right, that, that's quite rough, um, especially when you're dependent on all that. Uh, um, you know, yeah, sure, that's quite rough. Sorry, I just hit a blank there because I'm thinking, you know, especially those that depend on every cent that they need to get. So, yeah, that's that's rough. Okay. Employees, uh, can top up. employees can top up the benefits. So you can have a situation where your employee is paying a portion and those is paying the rest. So you can have uh, that in play. Okay, okay. So that's good to know as well. Right. Okay, well, um, Caroline also just adds there that as long as she has been contributing consistently, she can apply. She must just ensure that she has all the correct documentation at hand. Okay. Good. Okay. For that. 
Thank you. And Derek is saying wishful thinking. I'm guessing that that's wishful thinking getting paid from, <laughs> from <laughs> the <laughs> I can't comment on that. So thank you for that. Well, guys, um, that's all we've got time for today. Thank you for joining us. I hope that's been insightful to all of you. If you would like to get hold of Garth Cullis at uh, Fairbridges with him and Becca, we will post a link to, to their company in the comment box below. And uh, there we go. I've got lots of airplanes flying overhead me today. So I hope that's not making... Too, too much noise. But yes, uh, FASA is a non-profit organization that protects lobbies and promotes ethical franchising and also uh, for transformation with a focus on transformation. FASA also offers membership to both existing franchisors and franchisees who supports and runs ethical businesses. If you'd like to know more about FASA, you can find them on their website at www.fasa.co.za. So thank you all for joining me today. I hope you have a wonderful week going forward and thank you again, Garth. Thanks, Naomi. Thanks for having me and have a wonderful day. Pleasure, you too. And uh, you. from us, till next time. See you. Bye, viewers.